All right, so this is a, um, a follow-on, I would say, to this morning's talk by Ben. It, it, he set the stage, he set the, the bar very high. And uh, now I'm going to, to try and achieve something close. I used to be a pole vaulter, and uh, you know, you'd have to clear the same height as the guy in front of you in order to advance to the next level. So I don't think I'm going to get that far, but uh, we'll, we'll see how I do in terms of uh, what, I can get, what I can get through today. So the original title was Risk Assessment on the Schedule. I changed it to Climate Change Risk Assessment. Everything we're talking about now has been chi climate change oriented. Um, I, I think one of the things that I do as a scientist, I try and maintain my role as an earth system scientist rather than starting to dive into the social sciences more and more. And I work with a lot of people who are in the social science community on uh, bringing the, the, the science that we do into the decision-making framework so that the, the combined decision analysis tools are, are properly, properly put forward. So this is the cast of characters um, that we have here. This is such a schizophrenic situation here. I don't know who to talk to. Yes? All right. So everybody here that doesn't have a name after, uh, a university named after them is at Penn State University. And uh, Ryan Sriver is a, person at uh, a professor at University of Illinois. He was in our group. And I've had a long, long time conversation uh, collaboration with Andre Sokoloff at MIT, and so some of the work is feeding in here on uh, some of the uncertainty work as, uh, as a result. Okay, this does not advance the slides. Okay, so I wanted to give a shout out to the group that we've, got, we've had going at Penn State now for the past two, two and a half years. This is called SCRIM. For those people who are in the theater business, the scrim is a thin veiled uh, background on the, on the stage, which sort of adds a layer uh, to, to set the stage for everything else that goes on on the, on the stage. Um, it's also just a thin sheet or a thin gossamer layer of some sort. So scrim sort of, sort of fits in terms of the decision analysis tools that are being built up across many layers uh, within the science of climate change impacts and, uh, and risk analysis associated with that. The question that we have right there in the center, what are sustainable, scientifically sound, technologically feasible, economically efficient, and ethically defensible strategies for managing the, uh, the risks associated with climate change? That's the main question that we're all trying to address. How many people could think they could do it all by themselves? Yeah, that's the that's the the goal here. the 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 design of this big giant NSF project is a uh, to design a network of institutions that will work together to try and address these uh, that particular question in a uh, at least pushing forward on the the boundaries of the the science associated with each of the parts of that particular uh, system. And so the the emblems at the bottom there are the universities or un, uh, or, or institutions. Penn State, Cornell, the Rand Corporation, uh, co the College of Menominee Nation is a, a, a native tribe in northern Wisconsin, and, uh, and they manage their local forest resources. And so we brought th them in because they have a very unique perspective on that's their livelihood for their particular uh, community. And, uh, and they're also sort of outside the, the, the general decision-making structure of the, the rest of the United States. And it's an interesting uh, discussion that we have. We have a few people at Yale, Boston University, uh, Cal Berkeley, or University of California, as the Berkeley people like to say. Um, anybody go there? No? OK. Uh, and then. Uh, Rutgers University uh, is the, the third one from the end. So that, that's the, the setting for a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, we have this, this big group, and, uh, and, and so some of the things are involved with that. And, uh, but I've been thinking about uncertainty analysis in some fashion since I was uh, a postdoc. Uh, so that's, some of that's coming out here. To further go into a little bit what goes, uh, of what's going on within SCRIM, so we're trying to assess the climate risk across the, this, this large field of, of, of issues. And the question is, if you're going to design a strategy that is satisfying that question, 
Um, I can never remember all five of the things, so you'll, you'll have to help me out. What we see is, is that we have uh, a number of different places where policy options are coming into play are going around this circle. Some people call this a mandala diagram, I think is what it's called. Um, so we're analyzing the climate risk strategies um, for each part of the, the, uh, the, the climate risk uh, set of questions. So at the top here we have in the blue box, um, we're asking which strategy are we going to have to use in order to address the climate change risks. Do we have to start here on the mitigation over on the, the right hand side of this uh, blue triangle? Are we going to be mitigating uh, the forcings of climate change? And that then feeds into the outer bound here, which is sort of our uncertainties across the earth system sciences. So we have greenhouse gas emissions feeding into greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, creating climate change, which then cl create climate impacts. And that then feeds back into the, the economic output in terms of a damage function to societies, uh, you know, the wealth that's available to, to address these particular issues. And the, the colors here, uh, are indicating the, the feedbacks around this entire loop and we have positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks. Hopefully the strategies that we're putting in place here are all negative feedbacks that are going to wind up limiting climate change risks and, uh, and so that's, um, so inside here we have these, the strategies which are listed mitigating greenhouse gases, uh, sequestering carbon would be d directly re reducing the concentrations uh, geoengineering would be putting something into, this, into the, the, the entire system, either uh, through indirect or direct effects, I would say. In, in some sense, mitigation strategies these are a geoengineering uh, task, but they're just a different form of geoengineering. And then finally here, if you can't stop the problem from happening, you have to adapt to it. And that then is the, the last one at the, at the top here. And on the, the bottom here, we have this the yellow or, or, or uh, beige layer here is sitting on top of another layer of, uh, of, of, of knowledge, we, I would say, and that's this issue of the values. Um, throughout this whole process here, uh, we have values which are inherent to the science, we have values which are inherent to society, we have values that are associated with individual risks that we're, that we're putting out there uh, uh, that are being uh, assessed. And, and at each stage of the process, we have, uh, we have to recognize when are our values influencing our decision uh, process or the, the structure of the way in which we do science even at times. So an example from that's sort of a purely scientific value is, that I brought it up this morning when Ben was talking, was do I value uh, the coastal, the coastal uh, regions of the, of the planet more than I value the, uh, the, the middle, middle of the continents. So temperature and precipitation are sort of affecting land primarily, but the coastal issues, are, coastal sites are being affected by sea level rise. And so I have to make a value. Do I want to really focus in on getting temperature and precip correct and not worrying as much about sea level rise? Um, or do I value the sea level rise problem and I can, I can create models which would be targeted to each one of those, uh, those various risks? Is this making some sense? Yes? Okay. So that's the, uh, the, the, the stage that we, uh, we've set up for ourselves. And uh, the other, oh, that didn't work right. Whoops. Hmm. Here we go. Zoom. Excellent. Now it's going to work. Great. Nope, it's not going to work. OK, so within SCRIM, we've identified a large number of, of activities, which I think are represented uh, across the, many of these are represented in the room here. Um, and we have expert uh, groups of experts that would align themselves with these various topics. And across the top here, we have the uncertainty, uncertainty quantification group. Um, that's primarily led by Murley Haran, who some of you may know, a statistician at Penn State, who's been leading that group. We have a group working on earth system modeling and the analysis of uh, earth system uh, outputs of the climate models, uh, earth system models as a result. 
We have people working on specifically computational methods like the optimization tools that were talked about yesterday by Chen Yun. See him in the room here? Maybe. Um, but the, the tools of identifying uh, strategies or finding optimal solutions to, to specific problems would fall inside this uh, cyber tools and computational methods approach. And then we get down here into the bottom, and the, uh, these are, are, are start, start moving into the social science or, or uh, areas of the world. And so we have technology assessment, uh, directly talking with engineers as to what are the, 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 uh, uh, the, what are the capabilities of addressing fossil fuel use, renewables, carbon sequestration, geoengineering adaptation strategies. Integrated assessment is at the center of this whole uh, set of ideas uh, where you're bringing in information from across the, all, all, of the, uh, all of the others in order to, to assess what the, the net risks are in terms of economic, dollar, uh, you know, economic value or in some other measure which is uh, overall relevant. The one that we think about a lot now in the group is this trade-off analysis trying to identify the Pareto front, the, uh, the set of options we have available to us to make decisions that have essentially equal pain. I don't, uh, everybody has their own way of describing what a Pareto front is. I think of it as, as if, I, if, ev if everybody's responding at the same level, um, or n nobody is hurt, hurt any more than any one, any one other group, then we're sort of at this Pareto surface that the trade-offs uh, will benefit one group and not and and uh, take away from somebody else, and that there, and so there's different ways of, of thinking about that, and finding the Pareto front is a is a huge cyber infrastructure tool. Uh, finding those solutions to reducing greenhouse gases or reducing the threat of of, of climate risks such that we don't go beyond two degrees C is one sort of target. But we might also ask, what's the minimum cost associated with uh, reducing, the, reducing the, the threat of climate change? And so you could, you could say 2 degrees C or minimize the costs, and maybe those two things are equal at, uh, in, some, in some sort of space, but not necessarily always. And, uh, and, and so finding the, the, that equal distribution across them is another one. And then this, when are epistemic and ethical issues coming into play is where our philosophers are getting involved with the, the team. And then finally, we have this group of stakeholders and decision makers. And that's where um, the, we, we have to sort of determine from the stakeholders what it is they're actually trying to, to um, protect. Questions? Yes, I'm sorry. Start asking questions if you want. Yep. First here and then there. Luke. So just in terms of the, the trade-off analysis you're talking about and uh, finding in the, the point at which is equal sort of uh, pain right. sort of thing, you, you're, you're talking about in terms of uh, prospective mitigation options. So you're, you're, Correct. Not, you're not talking so much about um, uh, uh, the distribution of impacts and the how they No, we're all, we're, so it depends on how you set up the problem. So as, if, you can, if you can set up the distribution of impacts, then you can put that into your framework. Okay. And you, the part of the story is developing the tools, which is done in the top layer up here, to be able to go after the, uh, the trade-offs that, that you really want to address. And creating models, either climate models or impacts models, or bridging the gaps between the two of them that are, would then be necessary in order to do that type of analysis. And that's exactly where we're, where, where we're heading, and we're definitely thinking in those terms. And you know, at the end of this whole meeting, if, at, the, at the end of this talk, you know, bottom line is it's really hard. <laughs> so yes, and? What's the mental model that your stakeholders and decision makers um, So th this is a tool that the philosophers use to analyze the, the, the framework in which people think about a problem. They call that the mental model. So if we think of an Earth system model as a, as a numerical tool, they would say, how do you think about that Earth system model that you're building, and what are your strategies for building it? And they would then build a, a, a lexicon associated with your discussion of that process. And this then gets into the we, I've been through this process twice now, 
when we started asking what are the trade-offs between geoengineering mitigation and adaptation. How does, a, how does a scientist think about that problem? How does a decision maker think about that problem? How does a activist think about that problem? How does a stakeholder think about that problem? And you go into each community, have, uh, do a set of interviews, and then take the, uh, develop the, the lexicon and identify the, the values associated with that particular mental model. Um, or the, at least de de designing what the mental, or figuring out what that mental model happens to be. Is that helpful? Okay. Yep. And after that? After that, yep. Is there a methodology for dialogue? It, yes. It, uh, well, a methodology? For dialogue? Um, so once you, so in the, the, the way this t has worked a couple of times is you go to the community before you have a discussion or, and you know that there's going to be a meeting, say, six months from now. Like several people were at this big climate conference in Paris, I think, this last couple of weeks. And uh, if you had taken a, uh, taken a picture or a snapshot of the framework of how people thought about the problem, before they came together, and then after they came together, you would see how the dialogue changed their uh, their structure, the, the structure of their thinking process, their thought processes. Was it within Spin itself? Was this in the disciplinary that you have? How right. Do you convert and how do you go for, for a consensus? Consensus is not the goal, I would say, right off the bat. It's usually finding out where the distinctions are between the communities. So um, an example is the, 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 the Native Americans in Min the College of Menominee Nation. Um, their values have a very different structure than our values as to how they, they make their decision process. I'm trying to think of what the actual example was that we what we had. Um, the, they, didn't, they didn't place value on the, the money necessarily, but on the process of, 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 um, of having the livelihood of the, associated with the, the forests that they were managing, as an example. Um, you know, there, was, there were sort of sacred values associated with the space that they live in, and that was the critical thing that they wanted to preserve. But that would be an example of, of how they, that it would be different than w our viewing a, a forest as a resource to use um, as, a, as a society. And, and those two different structures would, w once you figured out that those are different, then you can have the dialogue and set up the discussion, which would ad address the, dis the differences amongst the, the two communities. So if that, that would be the, 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 the structure, the methods, I think approaches to dealing with those distinctions. More? No. OK. So we're, we're um, moving along here. Um, an example, um, the last thing on here is you see a lot of arrows, dots and dashes, blues and greens and reds. Um, and this is where we feel that there's, there are um, the green ones here are when one group is providing inputs to the other group. So technology assessment is feeding into the integrated assessment tools. Um, methods are, uh, are being fed back into the providing methods for another group, providing insights uh, for, for, for refinement of a particular group is, is the way we see that the network would not be able to do this in isolation. I individuals would not be able to do this in isolation. The network is required in order to build up the overall structure of the, of the problem as a result. Yes? Um, I hope not. Does it? So one of our PIs is Nancy Tuana at Penn State University. She's the director of the Ethics Institute on campus. And she's a philosopher by training. And so she's doing the, or is leading the ethical analysis group, yep. So the, they, they're sort of, sort of observing? Or are they, is that where you try to find common ground? So that's, that's determining. Um, when are the decision questions uh, being framed according to the, the, 
the ethical, anal uh, ethical analysis, the justice issues, the value-informed uh, decision-making processes. I'm probably not doing much justice to her right at the moment, but I'll do my best. <laughs> I'm happy to talk about this offline at any point. People want to see, so you, you sort of have a sense as to what it is. Um, one particular problem, I'll give an example of one problem that we're dealing with. Um, it has to do with sea level rise. We have a team, one of our Earth system modelers is uh, Dave Pollard. He works on the modeling of, of major ice sheets. And he's interested directly in how, you know, what's the threat of the Greenland ice sheet collapsing. And I know that I, maybe I put this in exactly for Charles because he works on the same issue. Melting. Melting. Greenland Greenland? West Antarctica? Yeah. Might collapse? Might collapse. Okay. <laughs> Greenland will melt, yes. What time frame is one of the questions. And, uh, and so that's, a, that's an area where there's, there's a set of uncertainty quantification associated with what's the timing uh, given various forcings, given various parameters in the models that, that are being used, um, then provides a, it could collapse in 100 years which would be everything going exactly wrong, uh, or it could take 500 to 1,000 years, 3,000 3, years. So there's a number of ways of thinking about it. Yep. More? Uh, well, so West Antarctica is the, like, the meters, could contribute a meter in 100? In 100 years. Um, that would be a high rate. That would be a high rate, yep. But that's, that's, the, that's the collapse of scenario. Right. Whereas Greenland's going to melt. Because, of, because the grounding line is not below sea level, uh, you don't have this major instability occurring um, at the edge of, edge of Greenland. OK, so uh, the green, if uh, a Greenland ice sheet disintegration could eventually raise the global sea, mean sea level by roughly 7 meters, uh, so what? How do we deal with that information? We want to know something about the timing of it. Um, we know that the, on the bottom here, these are the coastal areas of southeast uh, North America that would be impacted by it. And so six meter inundation is shown here. We would lose Miami. Nobody laughed. Nobody cried. So I think we're in a good situation here. Um, we have uh, New Orleans and most of the southern Louisiana here. We have coastal uh, islands along South Carolina, North Carolina, all the way up to Norfolk. Um, there would be major impacts on, on those coastal communities um, as a result. And then on top of that, uh, you'd be interested in what are the storm surges associated with the major hurricanes or the large-scale weather systems that come into the, the northeast uh, would be happening up, up here, over, over here, I guess. Depends on which map I'm using. And, uh, and so we're also interested in the threats of, uh, of the, how, how does the weather structure change? How does the climate, the climate jet stream position change? How are the, st the shapes and structures and intensities of the storms changing? Um, so we have many different groups working in this, uh, this particular area. OK. Sorry, can I yeah. ask my question? I'm, I'm kind sure. of confused by this, because in terms of the framework that you're talking about for the, for the previous slides, you, I feel like it's very much uh, on a at the very, very most centennial time scale, you're talking about policy relevant sort of things about how you're going to adapt and mitigate over the next sort of century. But I feel like for that sort of problem that you're talking about there, and you're considering what's going to be happening to the weather given a six meter sea level, sea level rise, I feel like that's something that you should, you'd be considering for 2,000 years down the track. And I feel like the time scales of. of for for 2,000, you mean like right that, now? Like, well, like or you're considering what's happening to the changes in the weather given this types of sea level changes. So I, I'm combining two different issues which are distinct oh, in my, and I'm doing a badly, bad job of it apparently. That's OK. But the, the sea level issue is something that we have to worry about long term. Yeah. And the threat of storm surges being exacerbated by small sea level rise right. okay. yeah. is going to be, is going to be the, the alternative uh, associated with the, 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 the climate system evolving over the next few, several decades. Okay. So we, we do have them separated, but uh, I, guess, I suppose the uncertainty for the ice sheet response is, is, is you're, you're uncertain about the time scale, so you're considering the full range of possibilities. 
So this is a great example of where we're making decisions on infrastructure on the coastline that is going to be have a lifetime of say 50 to 100 years. Yeah. How long? How how often do we rebuild the ports? Um, how often is Venice going to rebuild its basements, uh, or or these sorts of issues is a, a good example. Um, and and how long are the so where where are the decision questions? How what's the lifetime of the result of those options, and how do we deal with those? And how is the threat of something at fifty? You know, a hundred to a thousand years in the future, is that influencing our decisions today, given the uncertainties that are associated with go which is what's happening in the future, and that's part of the the, the storyline. And it, it gets complex real fast, but we're trying to pick it apart, sort of on the ones which we think are are tractable at the at the moment. Okay. That's the actual time on my clock there, isn't it? I see. OK. I thought that was 15 minutes. It says 14.06. Yeah. All right. Now I got it. OK. So the other story about this is, this is this process of do we think through the process from an earth scientist's perspective, or do we think it through the process from a decision maker's perspective? And the, the standard approach, I think, from the scientist community is here's my model. Here's what it does. I, I produce some probability distributions. That feeds uh, the community abroad. And now they take that information and use, use what we give them. And as we heard this morning, there's a dialogue starting, or has been going on for a while, between the stakeholder communities and the scientists in terms of how is the information that's necessary for the decision making process being generated by the scientific community. And I think 10, 20 years ago, there was a big disconnect between those two groups. I'm looking at Ben because he's nodding his head, and this is a good thing. So we're, I think we're on the same page here. Um, and the and and so the the question is, um, at at some level, are we getting the right information? How do we know that we're getting the right information? And so the Scrim framework is is trying to uh, trying to ad address some of those uh, those issues. This is a. A, a diagram that has the integrated assessment model on the top here, Earth system models with all of their complexity here in the middle, and then the impacts and adaptation and vulnerabilities models uh, here on the bottom. And the, the, it's, I think it's fair to say that the, the communities associated with each one of these boxes often does not talk to the other one. How many people think that's the lie? Nobody thinks I'm an idiot for saying that. That's good. Um, but how many think there is dialogue going on between them? Some? Slim to middling? Yeah, middling to none? Medio, medio, right. OK, so and then there's, I, I think that that's the case as to where we are now. And what you see is, is that there are these linkages as to how are impacts and adaptation of vulnerabilities being fed into the integrated assessment model. Is the information to understand the, the, the economic pathway of the globe um, being imp impacted properly? Are the costs being as, uh, assessed as it goes forward? Um, when we're looking at ec economic models associated with climate change, um, are the, the information that we're getting out of the Earth system models, uh, is, it, is the information that's being fed into the, these decision-making models on the top or on the bottom down here, um, is that information accurate at the level of the science that we know state-of-the-art science would sort of be in the middle of this, this particular diagram? Um, and is the information transfer among these various groups uh, as efficient as it could be uh, and as adequate as it should be? So the last one here is the, is the one that uh, brings in a little bit of the science that I've worked on for a while. And there's a, there's a shift in the way we think about the problems from a forward process to an inverse uh, process for the decision-making analysis. And so as I described it initially, the standard forward mode is here on the left. Earth system, Earth system science feeds into risk analysis. The risk analysis feeds into the decision analysis. And then a decision is made. The alternative is to start with the decision analysis question and ask, um, what are the risks that are, 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 are threatening that particular question? 
like the sea level problem, for example, for Florida. Um, that means we have to do a risk analysis which is targeted to that very specific question. Are we getting all of the relevant uncertainties included in that particular decision making question? And then are we doing the right earth system science in order to feed into that particular process? And so the, the information flow would start with the decision maker and end with them saying, here you are, earth system scientists, go out, figure out the uncertainties that I need in order to ask what are my, the risks associated with my situation. Um, what is it, what, what's required of uh, the mitigation strategies to limit uh, sea level to one meter, 10 centimeters, whatever the number is that's, that's been decided is, the, is the, the biggest threat. And over, over on the side here, on the other side here, we have the types of risks uh, associated with climate sensitivity. These are probability distributions of climate sensitivity here on the right, but it's shown as a uh, reverse uh, cumulative distribution function. So it's one minus the probability in a log scale going out um, uh, to climate sensitivity here on the bottom, out beyond 10 degrees here. And in the, up until four and a half degrees, we see that the distributions all are fairly similar to each other. The, each of the, the colors on here is, uh, is one of the groups that had put uh, inputs into the IPCC process. So we have uh, Olson et al. on top, which is uh, Klaus Keller's group. Liberdonian Forest is one of our, our results. Aldrin et al., Urban et al., and then the CMIP um, high resolution models. Yep. And then the question is, is how are they dealing with the tails? And this has to do with who's making the decision associated with the, uh, the, the risk of some extreme event actually happening. And so if you asked, one community, um, I'm trying to re remember the examples, um, you, might add, you might say that you need a 1 in 50, uh, a one in 50 chance of, of, as an acceptable risk. And who is that community? Um, there are three groups that are interested in sea level rise. Uh, in the US, I think the risks are typically 1 in 50. Um, if you went to the Netherlands, I know that they have a, a 1 in 10,000 year event. So 1 in 50 year events uh, are, are to be avoided. The, the, the Netherlands say uh, 1 in 10,000 year events are to be avoided. So they have to build a dike to the, the, the level there. And uh, I, I'm trying to remember how the 1 in 50 came about. But uh, that, those are two different levels of acceptable risk. And what we see then is that if we take the at face value what these distributions are here saying about the long tail event, those five groups are saying very, very different picture, or giving very, very different pictures as to what the, uh, the acceptable risks are in terms of climate sensitivity that's required uh, in order to go beyond that, that specific level. And, and so who's making the decision is influencing the way in which we an analyze the, the tails of our distributions. And that's the, the storyline that I'm, I'm trying to sell you here. OK. And how do we deal with the fat tail problem? Um, so on and so forth. OK. That's over half my talk, I guess, right? Good. So I think this brings us, that gets, sets the stage for how the information that we're thinking about today is going to be feeding forward into decision making questions. We can talk about that as we like. Um, but I think that we want to get back to some of the, the details, get back into the weeds, and dig around in the dirt a little bit here with some of the other issues. So this is another way of saying what I had said before. Um, fundamental uncertainties exist for the projections of future climate. We have observational uncertainty, forcing or scenario uncertainty, modeling uncertainty, which can be both structural or parametric. Um, and then we have this natural internal variability um, as, as moving along. So with the rest of the talk, I, I sort of put it into three different goals that I'd like to address. I'm not going to have time to get into every one of them, but I hope to, to get into them in, at some level. Can we separate uncertainties between global and regional response? I'm going to keep going back and forth. <laughs> OK. Uh, how do we compare ensemble approaches, the multi-model uh, the, the multi ensemble, the perturbed parameter ensemble, 
uh, or the initial condition ensemble. How do we deal with those? And uh, that leads into what uh, feeds off of what Ben was showing this morning. And then uh, how does structural uncertainty and regional, uh, regional climate changes uh, get assessed? All right. Global mean temperature. We've already gone over this, but we, I don't think we've actually done a comparison of the CMIP-3 uncertainty analysis compared to the CMIP-5 uncertainty analysis. And the traceability of uncertainty as we move through time, I think, is one thing that is often overlooked. We often take a snapshot of what it is today. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, there's, there's a, the classic story of what, what is the speed of light. And in 1850, they had one number. Um, it was, then they, somebody reassessed it, it was super high, and then it was super low, and finally they settled in on 2.99 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Did I get it right? Okay, my physics is still, still, still there in my head somewhere. Um, so the, at global scales, this type of uncertainty analysis is going to be used for risk analysis. Um, and part of the story is the regional impacts and adaptation are, st are taking information from these different scenarios and the probabilities of these individual results um, and using them to as assess risk, whether it's in a, uh, a putting a, a set of bounds, an upper bound on what we think we, uh, you know, what's the likelihood of, it, of going above a certain number, or whether it's the actual range of probabilities, range of options that are being used in the decision making process. And uh, the pattern scaling approach is something that, if you haven't seen it, there are very good review papers. This happens to be one of them. Came out in 2004 by Claudia Tabaldi and Julie Arblaster. Um, and it, it does a nice summary. And inside this paper, what you see is uh, they have two figures. It's not very uh, profound, but, it is, uh, but it's nicely s summarizing exactly what the, why pattern scaling is used so much. And if you look at those uh, three figures on the top and take off your glasses, would they look the same? Are they pretty much indistinguishable? Yes? Very much so. All right, I'm seeing somebody that has good thick glasses. <laughs> I have, I, can, I have the same problem. So, okay. So, what you what you have on here then is the three different uh, scenarios: RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5, being shown here. Um, this is, I think, it's the multi-model mean. I'd have to go back. It's it's not on the figure there as to which one it is, but that's the those are the uh, projected changes in the at the end of the 20th uh, 21st century. And the numbers here underneath it show the, correlate, the pattern correlations between those individual combinations. 99%, 98%, 95%. So the, the middle one on the bottom here is between the, the one on the left and the one on the right. If we go down to precipitation changes, same story, uh, we still have correlations well above 80, uh, 85% or, percent or higher in terms of the pattern which is actually being uh, represented here. Is that good enough? I, sh I shouldn't say this this way, but we used to have a saying, is it good enough for government work, right? So, so Has anybody heard this? Yes. 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 Well, so that's what I'm... I think it is. Yeah. I grabbed this too quickly off the web this morning to put it in place. And I think they're normalized, yes. And so that's then giving us the, the that, that's why they're the same. Thank you. Yep. I find it curious that they've left out RCP 6.0. And I'll be wondering about this. A lot of the research, I feel like the mm. community has been almost implying that RCP 6.0 is for people who have selected which models to run for CMIP. Yeah. We said that we don't think this is going to be as likely because we're going to focus on these things instead. And right. We're going to these models there because yep. no one looks at it. Well, yep. Less, a smaller fraction look at RCP 6.0 because there's less models there. And I wonder if, like, the people who are choosing which models to run when they've made that decision or something. 
Has anybody, anyone here been asked to actually uh, advise a modeling group which ones to run? Is it, has, has, G, has somebody from GFDL or NCAR or NASA GIS asked anybody in the room here which model scenario should we run? Yes? Hadley Center, you, you've had that question? So we had that question. Uh, that yep. Right, and then and and but also between the two point six and the four point five. Uh, uh, the two point six is the lower bound, uh, uh, but uh, I, I think if you look at the deck experiment in sigma six, a lot of there's an intention that a lot of the other scenarios in sigma right. six will be, will be run by end mass models and packet scale. But the only deck experiment is eight point five. There will be no deck experiment for six, and I think that's a major gap. Uh, a deck is the um, I, I don't know. Right. This is the CMIP six uh, core set of experiments. I think I have this, the slide as to what they are. Maybe I should go. I could show that. You have a comment, please. Well, Claudia Tabali came to give a talk on this. Which point? point? Which, which runs to my? Which scenarios to run? Right. Okay. I guess she was on some Yep. And the answer is that uh, they wanted scenarios uh, to be significantly different from each other. From each other. Right. And so, uh, so from a st statistical point of view, each one uh, represents uh, you know a standard deviation away from the previous one. Uh, yep. And there are, there's also kind of political concerns in that they didn't don't want to necessarily keep on going. You want to, to basically uh, cover a range without implying that it represents uncertainty. This is all. Because people read yep. into it that if you keep on adding scenarios up high or low, you kind of imply by that that those are reasonable outcomes. So it, there's a lot that kind of goes into. There's heavy politics involved here. Uh, well, it's, it's, there is it's an exercise, but people will read into it more than they should. So you have to be careful in what you present to do so that you don't miscommunicate uh, what people might read from your choice. And, and this is knowing your audience right. is sort of the story here. Know who's going to be using these scenarios and for what purposes, and uh, providing a range which is plausible from the begin from the, the lower bound to the upper bound has always been sort of the IPCC's intent, I would say. Um, and as a result, there has been uh, a choice made. In the early 90s, the IS-92A scenarios, they had five scenarios, A, B, C, D, and E. And everybody ran C, or IS-92A, which was the center of the road one. And the other four were rarely run, or they ran the top one and the bottom one. And they never ran the two in the, the the other two ones in the middle. So the story has been consistent since the early 90s uh, up until today that they want to choose the the upper and lower bounds typically, and and run the what they would consider to be the business as usual scenario uh, in addition to that. And I think this this has come out of the the, the discussions from the inter integrated assessment community, which is actually producing the the economic pathways and the emissions pathways, which are feeding into the concentration pathways that are feeding into this, uh, these, uh, these figures. And just to point out for Luke here, the 17 is the number of modeling runs, which, was, which were done for the 6.0. And, and, and so people leave that off because they don't feel that it explored the full range of uncertainty for that particular scenario, which is then why it's not used as much. Yeah, and it, it's a fair thing. Um, if you have the computing power, people will do it, and that's what's represented by those 17, I would say. And uh, and then the the other ones are the ones that which everybody wants to is wants to run for their own national interests. I think is the way I would put it. Yep. Okay, so back to here. Um, not much else to say other than that this pattern P 
is the, is the time independent component. And the global mean temperature, T of T at the top, then is, the, is the, what's used, being used to scale these patterns as they, as they go forward in time. And so that's how these are used then to produce regional information, capital pattern, the capital P pattern over here on the right as a function of time. Yes? I'm just a little confused. Isn't it uh, pattern scaling to take a subfield uh, earlier on? So the, the class panel would be extrapolated within uh, RCP 6.5 to 2019. So there's different ways of doing this. One is doing a time dependent look at the problem, and then also a forcing dependent look at the problem. Is that the, what you're referring to? So if somebody wanted to create a 6.0 a, a uh, pattern based on these three, they could interpolate the response to the forcing for the, the, the two on either side of it. So all three of those are 2019, Yes, from our right. Figure two in the paper shows the distinction between 2050, 2090, 2150, 2200. And the pattern as it evolves, the, the pattern as it evolves in time as well. So it can be used in both ways. But it, the, the, the point is that it's only scaled by global mean temperature. And that's what the energy balance modeling community or some of the intermediate complexity modeling communities are, are, are calculating, given the uncertainties that I'm going to talk about next. OK. So what do we have here? Getting back to what I talked about on Monday, this issue of the epistemic uncertainty and getting the model right and getting the model physics right and the right structure right is, the, is, is part of the story. And I've been doing a little bit of work now on uh, what, what I call global telecon, de global telecon op connection operators. <laughs> if I could only speak. Uh, and these are. It, um, a way of investigating whether or not the regional response of an individual climate model is behaving in a similar fashion to another uh, global model. I'm not talking about regional climate models. I'm talking about the, the regional response of a global climate model and its sensitivity to the patterns of, of sea surface temperatures as, as we move forward. Before getting on to that, I wanted to talk about the global problem, and I, th I think I'll, I'm going to run through this rather fast. The, the classic things we talk about in terms of what controls long-term climate um, are, the on the left, we have the controls on the, the important issue and what's the parameter or uncertainties that are on the, the right-hand side. So long-term climate uh, warming is, is controlled to a large extent by climate sensitivity. The delay uh, by the ocean. Um, is what's controlling it, and in the, the uncertainties we have in our model are the rate of heat uptake, and the in the in the uh, the rate of ocean heat uptake in the various models, and then there's the issue of the net forcing, um, uh, which are then controlled by uh, the aerosols, the carbon cycle, the land use change, the natural emissions of greenhouse gases, and so on and so forth, and it's really when you get into these issues of ocean heat uptake and the net forcing that you also have regional information coming into play in the way that the model is then being forced uh, at regional scales in addition to the global forcing which is the well-mixed greenhouse gases um, as, as a result. Okay, um, climate sensitivity, there are these different definitions. I'm going to skip over it. Um, I did want to show, this is the, the, the the global mean energy balance equation, which we derive in, in undergraduate climate dynamics classes. And the first thing I wanted to show is, is that we're deriving the, 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 the time rate of change of the temperature anomaly, the difference from the equilibrium state. And that's the way, that's, we had a discussion yesterday about the feedbacks and sensitivities as whether or not they're de dependent upon the state of the model and, and how that plays itself out. And so we have. The change in global mean heat content, that gets into the, the ocean heat content changes that we've been observing. Uh, we have the future forcings. Uh, we have the net feedbacks. Lambda is 1 over the climate sensitivity. That's the, the term for it. And 
anything that provides a net feedback is then scaled by the temperature change itself so that there's now an additional forcing because of extra water vapor in the system, uh, so on and so forth. And then the last one here is this flux of heat into the deep ocean. So if you take a, a holistic view, which would at least include the ocean and its, its uh, heat, overall heat capacity, um, we would have those terms uh, being uh, contributing to the, the global mean energy balance. And for me, conceptually, this is a good starting point. Um, it's a good framework for organizing our thoughts and where the major uncertainties are in the, in the, um, the, the global climate model, the, 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 the full Earth system models as well. Um, the problem is, is that, as Ben was showing, there's so many parameters which are controlling climate sensitivity in a model that it's not a single parameter that you have to, 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 to twist in a, single, in a single climate model. What you have, whereas in this simple framework, you have a single number here. And so the distinctions between how an, using an energy balance model to calibrate climate sensitivity compared to a full Earth system model or an intermediate complexity model differs a lot in the way that the model would behave in terms of its uh, time-dependent behavior and response to time-dependent forcings. OK. Talked about this. Talked about this. No, we didn't talk about this. But I wanted to get to another, another topic. This is the, the box for the IPCC ranges of climate sensitivity that we have over, over here. And there are multiple sources of information which are feeding into the climate sensitivity estimates. And there's an inconsistency in the way that the climate models are showing up with a cluster which is fairly high, 3 to 3.5 degrees here, compared to the, what the instrumental groups are showing as their best estimates up above here, or the, the groups which are combining information down here at the bottom. Uh, uh, and the paleoclimate community has its own estimates. And so there's a, an issue with the, the consistency amongst all of these different lines of evidence for what the climate sensitivity is. And that's a, that's a whole week's talk. OK. But I have to point out where my group is here. OK. I'm going to skip over this. Um, we have some new results. Uh, where we've looked at how the effect of adding an extra decade of information is changing our estimates of climate sensitivity and where the, where, how much extra heat content there is. And ask me offline about that if you'd like. OK. The regional part. Why do I think pattern scaling isn't everything? That's what this, is, that's what this issue is, is really about. Um, if we look at January 2014, we had a, the picture of sea surface temperature anomalies is here on the, on the left, OK? And these are the actual temperature anomalies, uh, deviations from the averages for the particular location. And if you asked, what's the dominant feature on there, raise your hand if you think it's the land. Raise your hand if you think the, which one is the most, pro, mo, well, OK. The dominant p feature on that particular map is the land changes or the ocean changes? Land changes. They're the most significant when you look at the picture this way, right? If you add in this picture, now you're asking where do they fall within their range of options, or their, the range of possibilities over the historical period. And so now we're looking at it in terms of a quantile approach which ones are at the extreme edge of their distribution. And now we look at the picture, and the, the bright reds are showing up here in the ocean off of western North America over here, whereas over on this figure, the dominant features tend to be over land. So in this case, it's showing that the extreme, uh, the extreme temperatures over land uh, are tightly tied to the extreme temperatures in the ocean driving circulation changes. And this is a view of, if we ask any given year, and we ask what the, what the seasonal pattern is, what's dominating, the, what's driving the, the seasonal pattern of, of climate change over land, the, 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 the sense is that it's, it's tightly controlled by what's going on with the sea surface temperatures over, um, around the globe. And in this particular case, there's a little bit of uh, extra warming here in the, uh, or, or large 
deviations of temperature change in the western, yes, the western Pacific, large changes here over the North Pacific, changes here in the South Atlantic, and you can start to see how is that going to then influence the, the atmospheric circulation um, for, a given, for a given season. And January was extremely cold over e eastern North America this particular month two years ago. And so it, it's, it's a nice way of illustrating the issue. So SST patterns are a significant driver uh, of land surface temperatures and, uh, and sea ice uh, is potentially uh, as important. We don't know, the, uh, I don't think we know that, part that particular issue very well. It's not put on this particular figure. Um, and so it implies then that regional changes uh, re require a better estimate of ocean variability uh, if we're going to be getting seasonal predictions of, of uh, land temperatures in the future, we're going to have to make sure that the ocean variability is then correct at driving these uh, teleconnections throughout the atmosphere as a result. So back to the structural uncertainty. I know I've only got a few minutes left here. Um, how do we go about assessing uncertainty at regional scales for this type of phenomena? And how do we know that the climate models are getting the right teleconnection information showing, showing up in the, the results as the extreme temperatures off of uh, North America? Are they driving the, the, the changes in the polar vortex? Or are things going on in the tropics which are also influencing the polar vortex or in, influencing temperatures and precipitation over the, over the land regions as well? So we've created a set of idealized experiments which can, could be turned into an intercomparison project if we wish, um, where the known forcings are sea surface patterns, sea surface temperature patterns. And then we're asking, how does the model respond at regional scales? And the purpose is to, is to determine whether the teleconnection response adds to the overall mean climate pattern and then would augment the pattern scaling approach that we were, we were discussing at the beginning. Um, since we're in a physics institute here, I, I put in the term that they use in the physics community, which are called second order cu cumulative statistics. Okay. Is anybody not familiar with teleconnections? Nobody admits it? Good. Thank you. Oops. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so our goal is to understand how a model responds in terms of something we call a global teleconnection operator, the GTO. Um, and pr I purposefully chose that because it has a connection to really fast cars, just so you know. Um, we estimate the ensemble mean response, R, to an SST forcing, F. And the SST forcing is localized and can be identified anywhere across the globe in the oceans. Uh, it just so happens that I, I chose the one here in the West Pacific, but the blue X's were the locations that were initially done by Barsugli and Sardishmuk in their, their early papers. Since then, we've added what we call a random patch approach here at the bottom. Note that that's an RPM. And uh, so for the car buffs in the audience, you might like that. And what we look for then is estimating this, this basic linear response of a, uh, to a, a forcing here. And we want to know what K is. And that's the sensitivity information. The sensitivity information then is the operator that could then be used to assess the influence of a given SST anomaly in a given location to influencing the regional response at a, at a fixed location, in this case, over North America. Okay. We have done this for a large number of models, all versions, multiple versions of CAM, also for the GFDL model. And the, we're starting to work with the Hadley Center model. Um, and we have a, a matrix here of different resolutions, different numerical cores, um, different physics packages are sort of shown off from left to right within CAM, different generations. And, uh, and so we have this way of, of com intercomparing the, the, the results as a function of model type. Here's an example of one of these. I've picked. The, uh, this is a comparison of the various, various physics packages, CAM 3.1, 3.5, CAM 4, CAM 5, and then the GFDL model. And what you see on here in color is the sensitivity 
a k, the, the value of k, which then tells you how much that location in the oceans is influencing the regional response in the green box. And in this case, it is one of the Georgie regions. Yay! Uh, Central North America was the one we chose here. Uh, we're looking at this because it's a Midwest agricultural problem. It's the June, July, August precipitation total over that particular box. And, and so what you see is the influence of the, in the CAM 3.1 model has a very strong impact of the West Pacific on what's happening in Central, uh, Central North America. Whereas it, you go to a higher order physics models, so the CAM 5 model is over here, you see that that's been significantly reduced and much more localized. And so we can, we're able to start to distinguish between the, the individual models and what their local influence, the, what the regional SSTs are and how much they're influencing the, the individual, uh, the localized region. Um, we can compare and contrast the CAM model against the GFDL atmospheric model, um, and so on and so forth. We can also compare the dynamical core. Yes? Is it causal? Yeah, in So the chain of events is typically that you have an SST anomaly driving convection. Convection creates a large heating anomaly in the upper troposphere. That tropospheric heating anomaly uh, pushes the, the subtropical jet or some feature in the, the large scale circulation. That then generates a, a stationary Rossby wave propagation, which then influences the, the region. And, and then there's the, the internal variability of the system is then confounding the estimation of this sensitivity. And so you need, in this case, we're running on the order of 500 to 1,000 simulations in order to beat down the noise so that we can identify the signal. And, so, and that's part of the, the story. OK, um, here's an example of the Mississippi River Basin and identifying then what regions of the ocean are influencing the, the Mississippi River Basin. But I also showed this here because we can use this in a reconstructive sense. We can estimate, if we take the historical SST patterns, multipl multiply them by the sensitivity information up above here. You can think of this as an empirical Green's function is another way of thinking about it. And we then add up all of the, the contributions from the individual locations over the, sea surface, over the sea surface as a whole, add them up, and then we can ask, does that reproduce the, the expected temperature change or the expected precipitation change in a given region? And so in this case, it's not working very well for temperature. T850 is the 850 millibar height uh, temperature. But when we look at the June, July, August precipitation patterns, we're seeing a fairly good correlation uh, with, with those, those patterns, which is then saying that the, the atmosphere is responding to those, that surface boundary condition forcing. And uh, it's just a simple linear function, which is then uh, contributing to the, the change over that particular location. We did the same thing for the Amazon and, and uh, Huanghe uh, regions. These are much better. They're in the tropics to a large extent. Um, and we can see that the, the variations and the, the correlations are, are much higher for these things. We're also getting the, the, the decadal time scale information. So there's a question about decadal variability uh, in the surface temperature and precipitation patterns. And that's, um, that's part of the story as well. All right. I'm never going to get to this. So I'm going to skip through it. We have cool maps like this one, similar to Ben's. Talk to me later. Um, we run a T31 resolution model. What I would like to say is, um, in the same sense as, as you were showing this morning, Ben, we've done a, this ensemble and asked, are we covering the same spaces of the parameter space or the response space? And so we ask the, 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 the colors correspond to these colors. Green for CCSM3, large ensemble that we've done. Uh, the CESM1 ensemble, um, 
the CMIP5, CMIP3 archives are in here. And so we're asking, are we covering the same space of information? This is not the figure. To sh that's just to, to, to look at this. But these clusters then are showing up as different response spaces depending on which model you're using or which model ensemble you're using. And so my comment about multi-model ensembles versus perturbed parameter ensembles versus initial condition ensembles is that each one seems to be giving a different type of information. And you have to be careful then that you're, if you're trying to span the entire response space, that all of these are, are, are being included in your overall estimate of the uncertainty. So all right, summary. I'm done. So, any questions? I will put these up. Yep, go ahead. Um, I was really interested about the, the last one Colton was talking about uh, working out this SST link and then right. overlaying it into the observational record, which we get recent. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, we're very close. Yes. So that's a, that's the the overall question was could we do it to begin with, and then the next issue is what types of applications like that yeah. will it will it be useful for? Because is, is it the background decadal changes, dec decadal time scale changes in SSTs which are driving the the likelihood of these uh, climate events like droughts, so on and so forth. So we've looked at Western North America. We did the, uh, the Colorado River Basin as one of the cases, and then asking, do we get the right drought time frame and the, the, or the right wet periods correct for the past 50 years? So to some extent, the, the validation of the quality of the model that, that doing this, and you're comparing with observational record of the overlies, and you can say, all right, now for that region, I can go Yes. Yeah. It's a proof of concept uh, to begin with. It's also a diagnostic of the model. So there's two different ways of using this, this tool. It's a way of saying that this model differs from that model uh, in the way that they're responding. And then it's also if you see some skill in reproducing the, the full nonlinear model or reproducing the observational record, does it, can we then put it into use for analyzing some of these cases? Yeah, Ben. So these are, it's, it's close to being a perfect model experiment in the sense that we take the full nonlinear model with the same SST fields for the historical period, like an AMIP style simulation. And then we let the model run out. And then we ask, is the linear reconstruction of the signal giving us essentially the same signal as we see in the, in the AMIP style simulations? And uh, there's an issue then again of internal variability contributing to the signal in the AMIP runs in addition to contributing to the variability in estimating the, the, the magnitude of the sensitivities. Yeah. And that comes into play. Yes? Yeah, I have a question. It has to be done for years. Mm -hmm. 50 years in the AMIP Yes, and we ran a 15-member ensemble or 10-member ensemble of the AMIP run okay. to get a signal. Yep. No. In that example, yes. We have done the, the, the similar things for observations in other situations. Right, right. You didn't show that. I did not show that. 
And so when you said 500, I was just saying, what was your 500? 500 18 month long simulations, which then are used to then estimate the sensitivity and the, the sensitivity uh -oh. uh, coefficients. Yeah. So, just other you can show us, can you just tell us how good were those models in capturing the observed changes in, in the tropical regions? Uh, no, no, in the mid latitude, the one that you were showing. In the mid latitude ones. Mississippi, uh, you know, the, the things that you were showing. So we, we, we looked at dust. We looked at the, um, for, the, for the, what I showed there, I did, we did not do the observed records, I don't think. I'm not sh in that particular paper. We, we've done the same thing with the NAO pattern and the, and the uh, PNA pattern and asked, can we reproduce that? And that's an example of where we're getting the, the, the same type of signals in those particular cases, and we looked at the observations and asked how it behaves. So that good comparison between the sort of the uh, so-called simulated versus the uh, right. It just says that the model has reproducibility. Yes. That's all. Yes. It doesn't say anything about how good is model in getting the actual thing, but it does have reproducibility. So if we're doing a perfect model comparison, yeah. can I can I reproduce what the non the full nonlinear model is capable of doing? Yeah. Yes. And whereas the, uh, the observed SST fields um, would, would, have other influ would have other influences and also the internal variability of the system would be contributing. So this would be considered the, the force component by the SST fields at that particular year. Yeah. Whew. Yep. Woof. All right. <laughs>